Alright you guys, so in our last video we were talking about American Gods, and the best way I can sum it up is um, a pattern of behaviors, um, thought forms, perspectives, ideologies that kind of emulate some ar ar archetypical being. Um, so something like a lesser god that you would see in the distance um, would be something small like road rage. Um, it, it happens every day, but only in a specific setting. Um, it, it causes you to change and, um, react more, um, tribalistic, animalistic. Um, so that would be something like a lesser god, a greater god or archetypical being. Um, so I'm going to use the example of the Karen, just cause I think she's, she's the one who's, um, showed her face the most within the past year. Um, the care and I'm pretty sure everyone's probably related to one or two Karens at least. Um, it's it's the idea of the I want to speak to your manager because my food came out two minutes late, or the um, the type of person who uh <laughs> calls the cops on people for walking their dogs in the the wrong park. I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, that that would be something like a greater god in my opinion just because she uh, it, it seems like she's she has a, a greater like role um uh in in whatever game is currently being played on society right now um it, it and i wish i was more well versed in in these archetypical beings i'm not and i really need to do more research on that but it, from what I can deduce, it seems like she's her sole purpose is to like spread discord, um, disharmony. Uh, the best word I can come up with is cacophony, like almost like a harpy in some way. Um, but yeah, so today actually, uh, so in that video we were talking about how gods exist. Today I'm actually going to be explaining how they don't exist. <laughs> Um, and it's, uh, I'm going to show you how to balance both of those, um, beliefs at the same time, how to, how to get beyond that, um, nature of duality of thinking it's one way or the other. Um, and to do that, I'm going to use an analogy of the trees, um, more specifically those ones back there. Um, these ones up here kind of, but they're a little bit too detailed, um, to, ex too detailed to, um, relate to what I'm talking about. Uh, you can kind of see it in this scene too, Adventure Time. You can see how like the trees are all this like one amorphous blob or mass. Um, you can still see the trunks on the bottom, um, so that's not exactly what I'm looking for. Um, Looney Tunes was the best one at it. Look specifically at the buildings, how they're just um, abstract polygonal shapes with one shade of color. <laughs> One or two. That, that one's a good one. This one's also a really good one. Just the buildings in the background. Like, that's all you need to understand. That's a whole city. And it's just <laughs> tall lines. Um, and the best... I'm, and I'm sorry I couldn't find a better one. The best way to describe it is uh, um, when it happens with crowds of people. Um, so, so you can see... So most people... Um, might have some clothes on, but a lot of them are just reduced down to, like, one shape and one color. Um, and the people who have clothes are pretty much just, like, horizontal, horizontal lines of, like, a darker shade of that color. <laughs> but, yeah, it's that, it's that idea. Sometimes you'll see it where the whole crowd is the same shade, and it's just, like, heads, like, um, <clears throat> just heads and rectangles for bodies. Um, so I'm pretty sure there's, like, um an animation term uh, for this type of effect when you do it like in a cartoon or something. But there's also um, a psychological equivalent to that. And I'm pretty sure it has other names, uh, but what I like to call it is seeing the forest for the trees. And this is what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> so uh, to understand this, you have to go and look, okay, what's... Uh, this is actually the opposite of the uh, phrase, uh, someone who can't see the forest for the trees. Um, you saw it in Seoul. She's heard this story about a fish 
swims up to an older fish and it says um hey i'm trying to find the ocean you know where it is and the older fish turns him and goes the ocean we're swimming in it <laughs> and the younger fish goes this no this is water what i want to find is the ocean um so that fish is actually what he's doing is he's not seeing the forest for the trees he doesn't realize he's in the ocean because he's too focused looking at the tiny details of like no this is water this isn't what the ocean is supposed to be um so yeah someone who cannot see understand or focus on a situation in its entirety due to being preoccupied with minor details <clears throat> so that's someone who can't see the forest for the trees Again, what we're talking about today is someone who only sees the forest instead of the trees. Um, this is a really good book. I read this like 10 years ago. It's been a while. Um, but they talk about uh, snap judgments and how we our first impressions are really more powerful than we realize. Um, so they had this story of um, orchestras, like especially back in like the early 1900s and before... Um, they were really dominated by men. Um, basically, like, they thought that, um, like, women would have, um, women would be allowed to play, like, the more feminine instruments, like, um, the flutes, clarinet, maybe, like, the violin, but they would never be, like, first chair, you know? Um, and the men obviously would play the more, uh, <laughs> quote-unquote macho instruments, like the percussion and the cello and stuff like that, too. Um, and for the longest time, we'll read out of this, um, Rainer Kutrell, the concert master of the Vienna Philharmonic, once said he could instantly tell the difference with his eyes closed between, say, a male and a female violinist. The trained ear, he believed, could pick up the softness and the flexibility of the female style. So these people, like, um, basically believed that, um, women played more feminine, men played more masculine, and they just accepted it as fact. Um, but then they discovered, um, so what they did was, um, I think sometime in like the mid 1900s, uh, they started doing auditions, uh, with screens, um, in, in front of the people and, uh, they would do all their best they could to hide any sort of, um, um, like indication of who that person was all they wanted to do they were what they were trying to do is basically just hear them play they didn't want to see that person they didn't want to know who he or she was they were given a random number um stuff like that and what they found was this um over the past few decades the classical world has undergone a revolution what the classical music world realized was that what they had thought was a pure and powerful first impression listening to someone play was in fact hopelessly corrupted. Some people look like they sound better than they actually sound because they look confident and have good posture, one musician, a veteran of many auditions says. Other people look awful when they play but sound great. There is always this dissonance between what you see and hear. The audition begins the first second the person is in view. You think, who is this nerd or who does this guy think he is? Just by the way they walk out with their instrument. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is the idea of what I'm talking about, basically. So that what, what these musicians were doing, um, by looking at these people and assuming they would play awful just because they look awful, that would be, um, seeing the forest for the trees. So they're seeing the forest, the entire person for the tree, which is their musical talent. That's about the best way I can put it. Um, so there is a powerful lesson in classical music's revolution. Why for so many years were conductors so oblivious to the corruption of their snap judgments? Because we are often careless with our powers of rapid cognition. We don't know where our first impressions come from or precisely what they mean, so we don't always appreciate their fragility. Taking our powers of rapid cognition seriously means we have to acknowledge the subtle influences that can alter or undermine or bias the products of our unconscious. Judging music sounds like the simplest of tasks. It is not any more than sipping cola or rating chairs or tasting jam is easy. Without a screen, Abby Conant would have been dismissed before she played a note. 
with the screen, she was suddenly good enough for the Munich Philharmonic. Yeah, so she was actually, she ended up suing <laughs> um, the Philharmonic because um, uh, she earned first chair, basically, uh, doing the uh, screened audition. And whenever they revealed that she was the one who got first chair, the, the conductor or whoever was in charge uh, adamantly refused to allow that. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, she ended up uh, suing and winning and staying on the Philharmonic for that. Um, I don't remember these two, uh, but I do remember the, the 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 one that he's referring to right here. Sprite um, actually did a um, an experiment because they were trying to um, try out different. Um, logo colors um not logo colors they were trying out different combinations of the logo so what they did was they would put uh the same recipe of sprite in two different cans one the original which is like mostly green and a little bit of yellow and then they put uh they wanted to try out another can which is i think it was more like 50 50 green and yellow um but what they found was that people did not like the other one the yellow one because it tasted too lemony <laughs> so that's another uh like <clears throat> this book goes into that that whole like the power like it really is an unconscious power like to those people that that sprite even though it was the exact same sprite because they saw it in a yellow can and internalized that it literally tasted different to them so this this concept of seeing the forest for the trees it is very it's very pervasive you it, you really have to try hard to like um go underneath and see where all these are um it's a very good so i definitely recommend this book um because it, it goes into a lot of like different um examples of how this works um Oh, yeah. And then this is me talking to uh, some person online. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm talking to an atheist. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I always bring up atheists and rag on them. I used to be one of them. <sighs> it's whatever. But anyways, um, I used to argue with them and they would do this thing where I would say something um, against atheism and they would just assume I was a fundamental Christian. Um, and I, I, people do the same thing whenever I would talk, um, a lot of people are probably like moderate. They have this problem where you talk to someone conservative, you argue against them and they assume you're liberal. You talk to someone liberal and you argue against them and they assume you're conservative. It's this type of like tribalistic, like it's just another example of seeing the forest for the trees. But I really, I really lay it out right here. Um, not to toot my own horn, but, um. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and read that. The stupidity and irrationality you mistakenly attribute solely to religion is more pervasive throughout society. Oh, so this person was talking about um, how religion makes people stupid or makes people believe irrational things or makes them do bad things. Um, and I said, and I was basically like, um, no, religion doesn't make people stupid. Religion just becomes stupid because stupid people follow religion, basically. That sounds awful, but <laughs> that's about the best way I can put it to this guy. Um, so yeah, uh, hence the current prevalence of tribalistic mindsets pitting opposing groups like atheists versus Christians, Republicans versus Democrats, feminists versus Meninists, etc., as if one group's destruction could lead to the other's salvation instead of being able to look beyond that primitive low brain perspective. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then I go into like, uh, what my kind of like personal theory of part of the reason why this is going on or not why, but like how it's going on. Um, so it's all psychology. We're constantly bombarded by our media with high signal noise that we process as danger or excitement. Think of how often the news follows the mantra. If it bleeds, it leads which chronically overstimulates our sympathetic nervous system, a.k.a. the fight-or-flight response system, flooding our bodies with cortisol and adrenaline, which inhibits higher-level thinking and makes us feel under attack. So we overreact when we feel slighted or mistreated by a person and fall right back into that dualistic pattern of hostility. 
Ooh, okay, that's a lot. <laughs> so basically what I'm saying is, um, so we have this fight or flight system, of course. Um, it gets riled up um, when it needs to. So like originally, um, we would be hunting and we would hear a rustle in the bush. And um, depending on your past experience, you would either react as if that might be a predator. Um, nine times out of ten. And nine times out of ten, that would be a useless reaction. But that tenth time, it would literally save your life. Um, however, nowadays, just think of how many how many bushes we have, uh, are, we 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 are aware of whether these quote unquote bushes are like our our social media, our 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 workplace, our home life, stuff like that. How many bushes we have and how many times they're rustling, especially nowadays with all the news that's going on and stuff like that. Yeah, we really do have this problem of chronic overstimulation of our fight or flight response system. And it, it really does turn people into these like low brain, animalistic, dualistic, tribalistic um, mindsets where... Yeah, I basically laid out here too. Religion is not your enemy just because you declare yourself an atheist. You've probably declared yourself an atheist because you think religion is your enemy. Um, yeah, there's this idea of, um, a, a, especially like New Age atheists, people who read like Richard Dawkins and stuff like that, they have this idea that um, science and religion are like mortal enemies, eternally opposed to each other, when in fact religion and science okay so like you, <laughs> you ever wonder why ages of enlightenment of spiritual enlightenment usually follow or come before ages of um technological advancement enlightenment and stuff like that uh these things that are a lot more um they work a lot more in tandem than you realize religion and science a lot of a lot of science is actually developed by religious folks so there it is. Um, yeah, so watch out for that. <laughs> this We're going to go into this a little bit more, too. Uh, XKCD. So this is a perfect example of someone seeing the forest for the trees. Literally exact same people making the exact same mistake on a simple math problem. <laughs> this guy sees this guy doing it. He says, wow, you suck at math. This guy sees a girl doing it. Wow, girls suck at math. <laughs> so this guy is literally like like those images. Seeing instead of seeing that person for an entire person like he does with this guy, he reduces her down to what a shape and a color, uh, one or two um, qualities that she has, <laughs> which are just a part of who, what she who she is as a whole person. So this right here, yeah, <laughs> great example. Um, so these, um, <clears throat> so we see these forests, um, of like race, age, gender, politics, and religion. Um, these are just like the main examples I could think of, um, <laughs> how much like boomer, millennial, Gen Z, um, tension there is, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, the, the, you would, reducing anybody to their shape and color is seeing the forest for the trees. Um, <clears throat> and it's, if you've seen the soul, you know, like there is like the, she, she talks about it where it's like, um, all of this is hypothetical. Like what is, what is being a, a, a man or a woman? Like, it's not like you're beyond that spiritually. When you go to heaven, you really think you're going to be worried about like your corporeal body you really think you're going to be male or female? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. You really think you're going to care about, like, politics in 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 the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we should be moving beyond. Like, yeah. <laughs> these, these things are very... Um, what's the word? Banal. Um, material. So, the best way I could describe... Okay, I'm going to tie this back into American Gods. Um, so, 
basically when you think of American, when you think of gods, egregores, beings, what you are doing in a certain sense is seeing the forest for the trees. You're looking at a giant pattern of behavior and recognizing it um, as a pattern and all following like some type of like archetypical deity. Um, this is where I try to explain it as, um, so you know, you've heard of these comps concepts there's no such thing as a shadow there's only the absence of light there's no such thing as cold there's only the absence of heat so i'm gonna get um my pen real quick so the best way i can describe it is you have a wave and it's in our mind we think it's going that way right when in actuality each individual like particle travels up and down it the the movement of the particles themselves are different than the movement of the wave. <clears throat> so in this analogy, the wave would be this giant movement that we see is what we're recognizing as an American god, as an egregore. This movement right here is the individual movements of of the people themselves. So a person needs to react in a certain way at a certain time in accordance with the people around them in order to produce like um, the whole effect of the of the egregore. Um, that's about the best way I can describe it. So basically, there is no such thing as a as as an egregore. There is only the absence of individualized, um, actualized, spirited action. <clears throat> That's about the best way I can describe it. So instead of seeing this wave coming... You're sitting right here and you see all these people reacting this way. Instead of sitting there seeing that and reacting how you how you how you would whether you, and if you react positively, you would get, obviously get put in a positive part. If you react negatively, you would get placed like down here. <clears throat> looking beyond all the noise of all these um deities and archetypes a, a true spirited being like there is no such thing as these as these egregores it's just spirited beings behaving unspirited that's about the best way i can describe it and i hope i hope this is this helps to delineate it It really is important. Okay, so it really is important to like you're you're trying not to react to the wave, right? Um, however, there is the concept of the of nodes. So if you have a string on a pole, you'll swing it, and it'll swing this way, but then it'll also like vibrate this way, and you'll have these nodes right here, which need to stay still and do nothing specifically <laughs> so there's there is like the concept of oh you need to not react to the wave but that doesn't mean don't react because at certain in in certain circumstances waves need people egreg egregores need people to not react in order to keep the wave going um what you really want to do, not what you want to do, <clears throat> what I'm trying to get at is true, true spirited action should be disruptive to this no matter what. Whether you're not doing anything or you're doing something that's beyond a positive or a negative reaction. <clears throat> that's, that's about the best way I can describe it. Um, so yeah. So there are no such thing as gods, really, at least the way I'm talking about them, these egregore beings. 
but that de- <clears throat> just in the same way like there's no such thing as an actual like wave traveling like that it's just particles going up and down but at the same time that doesn't mean you can just go out and ride your boat like it's all going to be calm like there's not going to be you're going to be over you're going to be like overweight by these by these waves if you just ignore it that way so you really do have to balance like believing in them and not believing in them um especially when you deal with these people in real life um you can't treat them as an egregore. <laughs> like you still have to treat them as a spirited being, even if they're not behaving in that in that way. Um, yeah, basically. Um, so yeah, ah, uh, Plato's cave. Ugh. All right. Um, <laughs> I I don't really like it all that much. It's not the greatest analogy. Um, so basically you would have these, I think I could describe it better. Um, so basically you would have these, um, you'd have these people here looking at, um, shadows on a cave wall being illuminated by this fire. The shadows are just projections of, um, whatever these objects are, right? (sighs) So the best way I can describe it is that there's not multiple people here. There's one person here. Think of it like the uh, like a VR um, matrix. So you have one person here. These objects are other people uh, living their lives in uh, uh, like hundreds of miles away, but all connected on this like internet um, VR game. So these projections would be what you see of their avatar and they would also be sitting in a similar room where they would see projections of your avatar doing its thing mm, that's the best way i can describe it so basically when when you're looking seeing the forest for the trees what you're doing is you're seeing you're reacting to the, to the avatar or to the shadow not to the actual being okay yeah that's why i say you can't just treat people as egregores because that's not i don't think that's how it works um so yeah um there is another thing i want to get into um this concept of like a tree a tree doesn't exist uh there's no such thing as a tree I kind of went into this in my video on Jainism. I'm going to bring, bring <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to be bringing up some examples from it. Um, so yeah, there's no such thing as a tree. There's only this thing in this unique form of a tree. So this is kind of like Plato's ideals. What I'm basically saying is there are no such thing as ideals without, um, let's see. Yeah, okay. So there are only unique forms, never vague A forms. So there's no quality without substance, no substance without quality. So um, Plato's ideals is basically him saying there's this idyllic quality of like what a tree is. But Jainism says there is no quality without substance, without an actual physical form counterpart. Um, There is no substance without quality, so there is no substance without any sort of, like, there's no such thing as a thing either that isn't a specific thing with certain qualities. I hope, I hope, I hope I'm able to, I hope I'm explaining this right, we'll see. Um, So in this sense, a forest doesn't exist either. It's a concept um, overlaid onto individual things. Okay. So in this sense, the simulation would be... Okay, you take a group of people... um, the simulation would be the actual, their actual, like, avatar beings um, in that sense. So when you think about it in this room, like, these avatar beings, they're not really there. These people are actually in another room. Um, so this right here would be the simulation. 
this right here would be the simulacra. Um, so if you kind of take this concept of the VR game, so like if you go into the game and you're living the simulation, you, you can like physically like push the people, right? in the game but like they're not really there but like they feel it. it there's like i don't know there's like that that counterpart to it basically um talking about it from more secular perspective so you have um the simulation would just be like the material world itself so you have like a crowd of people as the simulation and then the simulacra would be your thoughts of it like whatever you ascribe to it um basically so if you're looking at um a specific forest and go that's a forest the forest would be the simulation and you saying it's a forest is the simulacra in this sense as well a company doesn't exist either. There's no such thing as a company. Any company doesn't exist. So there's the people slash employees, buildings, products, and the flow of products and services and currency. <sighs> um... I think hmm. I don't know what else I have to add to this. So yeah, basically there's no such thing as a tree. There's no such thing as um mankind as a whole cuz like what you're doing there is you're just um Instead of saying this is um, a group of individuals, what you're doing there is you're saying you're you're in your mind. What you're doing is you're you're looking at the group and saying the group, a group, is one object. Instead of saying this group is a whole bunch of people. I hope that's the best way I can describe it. You also have to turn this inward as well. <laughs> and uh, you got to remember the words of Tyler Durden. You're not your khakis, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, you do you see your forest for your tree? Um, so you are not your body, your ego, your past, your gender, your job, your life, or your limited perception. So, um, in the same way, we want to look at these people and say they are not the forest. Like, yeah, you're behaving like a Karen and you're probably expressing that archetype. You are not the Karen itself, though. All you're doing is you're contributing to the wave. The same way Tyler Durden says, don't look at your forest as as your tree don't see all of this and say yeah this is me no this is your forest not your tree I think <laughs> remember this person like do you again do you think they're really gonna care what any of this is once you're beyond all that no 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 um Oh, I forget where. I really wish I saved this. I I'm, I bet this was a, like in the comments of on YouTube or just some random video that I saw or something. But they were talking about eliminating the to be verb. This is a really good example of seeing the forest for the trees. Um, the to be verb is um uh that like um. I am, he is. They are. This is the verb that I'm talking about, to be or not to be. Think of it this way. Um, so instead of saying, I am a musician, um, you would say, I play music. Uh, so what this does, it eliminates the... Um, when you say, I am a musician, what you're doing is you're automatically...
it's like you're rating yourself. Musicianship, like the in this sense, is like a a title or a certain level of skill. Um. So that what this does, it automatically pits you. Oh, so you're a musician, but are you a good musician? Like all what you're doing is you're automatically exposing yourself to judgment, whether it's your own judgment, whether you're whether it's positive or negative, or whether it's judgment from other people. Instead of saying that, when you say it like this, I play music, it's like, oh, so your music, you play music well or not. Like, okay. <laughs> it's not nearly as much as saying I'm a bad musician, right? I play music, but not that well versus I'm, I'm a bad musician. You see how that, like, it takes that forest away from your tree to where you're only looking at your tree instead of the forest. Um, you are you are an introvert, extrovert. You have some introverted, extroverted tendencies. Um, I forget who said this. I want to say it was uh, like an Asian philosopher um, who said there are two dispositions, those um, focused inward, introverts, and those focused outward, extroverts. Um, and then they also said that anyone lacking in either skill or discipline um is not a whole man um so you, yeah <laughs> in my mind the way i see it is so one of these is a skill that everybody has a skill in either one or the other and then the other one you have to develop as a or sorry one of them is a talent that you have that you were born with and the other one is a skill you have to develop um yeah but instead of saying um attributing like attributing it wholly to your personality like this prevents you from um being able to move beyond that and actually developing both sides which which is important um oh yeah and then finally we're going to talk about theoria apophosis <laughs> i'm pretty sure i butchered that um ken wheeler he's a youtuber as well i'll link him in the description um but he talks about so you have to go to his videos and sort them by the oldest ones because he got to go and watch his old videos where he was still wearing like the garb of like the traditional um Japanese yogi or sage or whatever <laughs> but like back then is when he would really go in deep into like all these subjects so I, I wrote down um this concept that he talked about several times so I don't have every um everyone written down these are probably just the more important ones um so he talks about this concept of the chita which um in essence would be the tree that I'm talking about this is your tree and getting rid of the forest around it is is one of the things you have to do. Um, so it's roughly translated as noose, spirit, and mind. Although we can get into like different things like mind is... Mm. <laughs> like it's always really hard to talk about like spirits versus soul, mind versus stuff like that. Because we have all these concepts and it's very hard to delineate them. Um... But basically, the chitta is the one that you, you're... The, the you that is you. Um, so yeah, purification of the chitta is what they talk about when they talk about Buddhahood. This is it. Nothing else is being purified it but the chitta. Um, it's the only noun capable of being taintless. It's the only noun differentiated from the five khandas or the five aggregates. Um... The five aggregates is a, a Buddhist concept uh, that a lot of people mistranslate. So what they say is these five aggregates are consciousness, feeling, perception, form um, in the form of like physical body, and then mental form or the form of the mind. Um, so what they say is um, you are not these five things. These five things are not you. And when people do that, what they say is, oh, so we're, we, we don't have a soul. I, the quote unquote, I don't exist. Um, <laughs> that's not what they're saying. What they're saying is the chitta, the you, is not any of these things. Um, and it's something you really have to spend a lot of time contemplating because 
there's really, it's very hard to, this is pretty much the, the everything um, in your life. Con like, how are you not consciousness? How are you not feeling? How are you not any of these things? That's something you really have to meditate on. Um, they say, turned away from the five towards itself. The chitta is that which grasps. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the chitta is also the only noun said to be the foundation of itself. Um, so you have this thing where it's like, you only know things in relation to other things. Um, however, the chitta is the only thing that is the foundation of itself. So it, it, it's the only thing that stands, that doesn't need to be related to something else to stand on its own. It's the only noun said to obtain the state of emancipation or liberation. And it's the only noun said to achieve freedom from becoming. So yeah, that is the forest <laughs> for the trees. Do not see your forest for your trees. Try to move beyond that. Try to find your real tree, your chita. <laughs> um, like I said, I'll link this guy's uh, YouTube channel on there and some other stuff. So yeah, check it out. Um, I think that's about it. Oh yeah, I did have an announcement. So I am starting a Discord. Um, so that'll be cool. I'll I'll link it all in the description. I don't really have any plans for it. Just kind of like a you know general like um casual chats and whatnot. Um, if you're interested, I I don't really have that many subs anyways. So I doubt like there'd probably be like three or four people on there. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm I might go on there and do like voice chats. Um. If I'm ever just feeling like it, if y'all are interested in that, uh, just let me know. But other than that, yeah, thank you guys. Check it out.